Lots of us amateur pianists really love Liszt, but unfortunately, most of his music is reserved really for only the most experienced of pianists. However, fortunately, there are some simpler pieces we can attempt, so stay tuned for some ideas of how we could tackle consolation number three. Are you sitting comfortably? Then let's begin. Hi, this is Tommy with Tommy's Piano Corner, the place for returning pianists or indeed anybody who loves piano to share tips and ideas of how to get the best from this great hobby. If it's your first trip here, then please do think about subscribing. Simply hit the little icon in the bottom right hand corner of your screen now and it's all done for you. Most of Liszt's pieces require great technical prowess to even attempt, never mind to play well. Luckily though, there are some simpler ones, such as Constellation No. 3, that regularly appear as encores for even the greatest of pianists. Today, what I'd like to do is a walkthrough of the piece end-to-end, -end, so we'll look at some of the technical challenges that we might find there. And then, after that, let's put together a practice plan of how we might go about tackling this. I'll also include details of how you can download a free study notes guide, so do stay tuned till the end of the video for that. The first evident thing here is the patterns. It starts right from bar one and is prevalent throughout this piece, so it's worth taking some time to study it and to practice it with the left hand only. The first thing you might notice is that we have 12 eighth notes spread over four beats. So in a way, these are eighth note triplets. Although of course, rhythmically, there will be no suggestion of triplets at all. The dynamics start at triple piano. And equally, the pattern often follows a jump that's to be accomplished within an eighth note. So even at lento placido, which is the marking of this piece, it still requires care to land properly. Moreover, we really want it to land softly to avoid any bumps in the music. Of course, in the introduction, everybody takes the bass note with the right hand, which avoids the leap initially. But afterwards, of course, the right hand is occupied with the melody. Most pianists I've seen will finger this pattern following the jump just by landing with the pinky on the lowest note. However, I did notice alternative options in Rami Barniv's recording of this, where he opts for taking the first note sometimes with the thumb and sometimes with two, and then crossing over to bring the hand into position. It's definitely an approach worth exploring as it would somewhat de-risk this jump, I think. The pattern in bar 9 is effectively a shorter version of that in bar 1 and you'll also find this employed in many places. Equally, I found one of the biggest challenges with this piece is to avoid ghost notes. Trying to control the left hand at a very soft dynamic isn't easy and the major risk I've found to watch for is the final note played generally with finger 2. Before we move on, let's quickly consider the use of the sostenuto pedal. As we can see, at the beginning, and of course in other places, we have a note in the left hand that is tied across pedal changes, and therefore ultimately it won't be sustained. However, we can use the sostenuto pedal to catch this note in the pedal and hold it right the way through, so the first time it appears, right from bar 3 up until bar 8, if we so wish. Bear in mind, of course, that not every piano has such a pedal, and they are notorious for being faulty. The next challenge with this piece is the polyrhythms. Liszt uses these quite a lot here, but generally at a nice sedate pace. These start right from bar 3, where we have 4 eighth notes over 6 eighth note triplets, so sort of a 2 over 3. 
This same thing appears at many places throughout this piece. Therefore, it's worthwhile practicing this carefully and becoming really comfortable with the way the two hands fit together. To practice this, I found that just taking it slowly is sufficient. Whilst it is a polyrhythm, it's nothing like as challenging to manage as those in, say, the Fantasy Impromptu or Debussy's first arabesque. The next example of a polyrhythm is in bars 5 and then again in bar 9. Here we have four 16th notes over three 8th note triplets. To practice this, I've simply picked the point at which I'll start the second 16th note, the first of course, which is tied over from the previous note so that it doesn't sound. We have another occurrence of this 4 over 3 rhythm in bars 22 and 26, for example. However, here we have eight 16th notes in one stretch to put over the left hand. I found it helpful to focus on the point at which the two hands play in unison when practicing this small section. I've studied many recordings and haven't found one where the pianist is overly strict about any of these polyrhythms. The melody is noted as cantando or singing. Therefore, it's important to ensure it sings very clearly above the accompaniment. Don't be tempted to try and get it as quiet as possible with a triple P dynamic, or it really won't sing. The melody is also presented later in octaves. And note that in both bars 20 and 21, the F natural octave is actually spread. Now, different pianists approach this differently in terms of timing it with the left hand. However, you can really afford to space the notes out here to emphasize this if you wish to. Now let's look at the jumps. The areas in which I found them to present the biggest challenge were from bar 30 onwards, basically where Liszt moves the melody into thirds rather than single notes. Here, the accompaniment moves into the shorter pattern, and so the leaps are now more frequent. The way I finally found that helped me to control these better was in fact to really focus on playing the left and the right hands together, rather than spending lots of time on the left hand alone. Initially, this entails adding a tiny pause between the last note of the pattern and then the bass note to practice the downward jump. Then practicing just the upward jump separately. Again, hands together, but focusing on where the right hand starts to play. Then we can practice putting the downward and the upward jumps together. Spending some time with each different set of these paid dividends for me. Now in bar 47, the left hand departs from its familiar patterns as it takes us towards the close of the piece. Most pianists opt to play this fully in the left hand. However, I've always split it between the hands, simply because it's easier to play and in my opinion, it looks more interesting to watch. As we get towards the end, we have the 16th note passage in bar 56. Again, Liszt is playing a little trick by having eight groups of four 16th notes, which of course would add up to eight beats. To practice it, I'd recommend paying careful attention to the position of your hand on the keyboard, moving it in and out so that you're nicely over the notes. Next, practice with rhythms and in different groupings until it feels effortless and you're able to speed it up and slow it down at will. In this final section, the right hand, I think, needs really careful attention. It's important that the thirds are played perfectly together. Otherwise, you sort of get what I can only describe as a plinky-plonk type affair, more reminiscent of honky-tonk than of Liszt. 
To help guard against this, I recommend watching your alignment very carefully. As the hand is towards the top of the keyboard, your fingers easily start to point more towards the right. And to play this well, I think it's safer to keep the fingers aligned perpendicularly to the floorboard to control the thirds at this triple P dynamic. Finally, note here that we also have the pedal mark right through from bar 57 to the end. Now you might want to experiment with partial pedal here, gently lifting it maybe a quarter of the way, fluttering it to help remove some of the resonance whilst keeping the legato. It's also marked as pedanosi or dying away. Bear in mind, given this starts from a triple P, that's not easy to do. The way I have approached it is in fact to play the initial chord as quietly as I can, but then to start the thirds at a slightly higher volume so that I still have somewhere to die off to. When we are planning out how to learn this, my recommendation would be to start at the end, in fact. Work first on bar 57 from the pickup in bar 56, as I described earlier. Next, work in the thirds in the right hand from bar 57, ensuring they're beautifully voiced. The top note should sing over the one below. You can focus right hand only initially and then add the left hand. You can also work on the left hand pattern in bars 57 and 58. Spending a few minutes each day initially on just these two bars will pay dividends as you move on to the rest of the left hand. Then I'd move on to the octaves from the end of bar 19. Practice both right hand only and then with the left hand. You should have no trouble with the polyrhythm by now as we mastered that when we were practicing bars 57 and 58 earlier. Work on the 8 over 6 figure now. Start just with bar 22 up to the first note of bar 23. Find a finger in that feels comfortable and practice the right hand only for a little while and then add the left hand afterwards. You can then do the same for all the different occurrences of this pattern. Then work on the different jumps first with your left hand only, but then with both hands. Try the approach I outlined earlier and see if that works for you. I know it significantly improved my accuracy here. By the time you've diligently worked through all of these areas, you can then start learning from the beginning. You should find that now you've fixed pretty much all of the technical problems and it's just a case of learning the notes and focusing on that cantando. You can download the free plan study notes from the link in the description. So if you are looking then to put some lists into your repertoire, then this is a great place to start. Now, depending on your level, you might not get it to 100% of what you'd like it to be on the first attempt, but it's one of those pieces that you can put to one side and then come back to some months later and start making those incremental improvements. For example, keeping that left hand right down to that triple piano whisper takes a lot of skill to do, and initially you might struggle to get it even less than piano, but then so what? Nothing will stop you from really enjoying playing through the piece and why start obsessing about that straight away? Put it to one side, come back to it a few months later and work again on the left hand to try and make it lighter. Finally, listen to lots of recordings of this piece. You'll find that many, many great pianists approach this in vastly different ways. So take inspiration from them. If you're not already, then please do remember to subscribe to Tommy's Piano Corner. Click also that little bell icon so you're notified of new videos as and when they're released. I thank you very much for watching and I will see you soon.